Lighthouse Christian Church family. We love you guys and miss you. Happy Easter. Bye. Hello, friends. Easter blessings of grace and peace to each of you. Let's celebrate Jesus. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen. Amen. Hey, church. Good morning. Good to see you guys. I, I miss you so much, but it's been exciting to be able to sing songs and uh, record with our amazing team, including Linda, who leads our, our uh, production of our broadcast. So happy Easter. God bless you. Can't wait to see you soon. Good morning. No, this is not the Weather Channel. This is Carolyn Dayton of Lighthouse Christian Church. Hey, I missed the Easter egg hunt, and I'm sorry for that, but I want to let you know that we are going to worship and celebrate the resurrection of our Jesus Christ. Happy Easter. Hi, everyone. We love you and we miss you. We hope you're staying well and enjoying time at home with your family. I know I sure am. Have a great Easter. <laughs> <laughs>
From ancient times, when a pastor would say, he is risen, he would expect the congregation to reply, he is risen indeed. So why don't we try that? He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. I hear you, and so does he. What a strange Easter season it has been. How strange? Well, I wanted to get a new Easter suit, and they said this was the latest style. I don't know if you've seen this. I thought it might be a little distracting to wear that, so I chose not to today. You know, we're used to being together on Palm Sunday. We're used to having a Good Friday communion service. We're used to having a huge community Easter egg hunt the day before Easter with around 1,000 people all gathered here in one place. And now it's about social distancing, it's about stay-at-home orders, it's about quarantines. I know it's been a challenge, but it's still Easter morning, the day that Christ rose from the dead. And so I'm so glad that you're joining us and celebrating his life here together today. Today we celebrate life. We celebrate Jesus. We're seeking to rediscover Jesus In the Gospel of John, Jesus made some rather eye-opening claims about who he is and why he came. He claimed to be the great I am. He claimed to be the bread of life. He claimed to be the light of the world, the gate, the good shepherd, the true vine, a king, the way, the truth, and the life. And now today he will declare that he is the resurrection and the life. Take that in for a minute. 
You know, we started this series two months ago. Think of how things have changed in two months' time. Our hair was a lot shorter. We were a lot lighter. Our bank accounts were heavier. We didn't worry about getting paper products at the stores. How things have changed, but somehow through this whole series, we've kept our focus on Jesus. And I think maybe there's a message there for each of us in our own lives. As long as we keep our focus on Jesus, we're going to get through this with his help. And so we've stuck with this series. We haven't changed it to try to be more topical, but yet there is much in each of these messages that speaks to our times and where we are. Funerals have always been a little bit strange. You ever been to a strange funeral? Like the good old boy who wanted to be buried in his four-wheel drive truck because he said, it ain't never been in a hole it couldn't get out of. Or the three friends who died and went to heaven. And they were all asked the same question. When you're lying in your casket and friends and family are mourning over you, what would you like to hear them say? The first guy says, I would like to hear them say that I was one of the great doctors of my time and a great family man. The second guy said, I would like to hear them say that I was a wonderful husband and a school teacher who made a huge difference in the children of tomorrow. The third guy thinks for a moment and he says, I guess I'd like to hear them say, hey, look, he's moving. Which is exactly what happens in our story today. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the most unusual funeral in the Bible, to John chapter 11, verse 1 and following. Now, as you're turning there, let me just set it up. Jesus is called to the funeral of a very close friend. I've conducted some unusual funerals over the years, but none like this. Please follow along as I read the first seven verses from John chapter 11, and then we'll read some more as we go. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now why does Jesus wait two days to begin the journey to heal a friend? We're about to find out. There is some confusion we find among the disciples as to Lazarus' state, whether he's really just sick and sleeping or something much worse. But if you look in verse, verse 14, Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. So they get to Bethany, and they find that Lazarus has been in a tomb for four days. And a large crowd from Jerusalem has gathered to grieve there with the heartbroken sisters. Jesus has an interesting conversation with one of the sisters starting in verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Well, we've all been hearing and thinking about death a lot lately. Every day the news channels have a running tally of how many people have died in our state, in the country, and around the world from this coronavirus. We've become focused on distancing, disease, and death, but Jesus came to bring closeness and wholeness and life. Because of him, we need never fear death again because he tells us he is the resurrection and the life. At least Martha believed that. What about the rest of us? 
The other sister comes out to meet Jesus. Mary, who had worshipped at his feet, but now her faith had been shaken. Look at verse 32 and following. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Well, that's what everyone's thinking. Why didn't Jesus do something before it was too late? Or was it? Let's read the stunning conclusion to this very odd story, verse 38 and following. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Martha, always the practical one. If you ever read this in the King James Version, it says, but Lord, he stinketh. That really gets the point across. That's what happens to a body after being dead for four days in a tomb. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. You would have believed too if you had seen a man die that you knew well and saw him get buried and then four days later saw him walk out of the tomb alive again. Now, Lazarus is not the first case of someone rising from the dead in the Bible, and he will not be the last. The Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Elisha, each brought people back to life. And Jesus has previously raised the daughter of a synagogue ruler and the son of a widow in a town called Nain. But no previous resurrection had the impact of this one today. Because some might wonder if those others, maybe they weren't really dead. You know, it was the old times, and they were stupid back then. They didn't know like we know today, which, of course, is not true, and the people really were dead. But some think maybe they were only unconscious, and then they revived. But there's no denying the resurrection of a man who's been dead for four days, whose body has begun to decay. Certain processes happen that you can't come back from unless there's a miracle. No miracle of Jesus had more impact than this one, for this one made him famous. This one resulted in the crowds coming to Bethany for his triumphal parade that we celebrated last Palm Sunday. This one got him killed because the Jewish leaders had had it. They were jealous and frustrated with Jesus' growing popularity, and they feared his movement would be viewed by Rome as an uprising that would result in the destruction of their temple and their nation. Jesus had to go. And when people started flocking to Bethany to see Jesus and Lazarus alive again for themselves, the chief priests decided they had to kill Lazarus too. How many times does this poor guy have to die? Jesus was probably thinking, go ahead, make my day. You keep killing him, I'll keep bringing him back to life. I can play this game. And Lazarus was probably thinking, whoa, now wait a minute. I've been through enough already. Can I opt out of this? Well, today I want you to hear Jesus telling you, I am the resurrection. Because that is a remarkable statement. Jesus does not just promise the resurrection to you. He's saying that he embodies the resurrection. Think about that. The power that raises people from the dead resides in Jesus. 
That's why the grave could not hold him, for Jesus is greater than death itself. When we are resurrected someday, it will be by Christ himself, who is the resurrection. You know, earlier in John's gospel, Jesus said, For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. It will be his voice we respond to. And later he says, And everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Jesus will be the one who calls us out of our graves. Now that's what Martha thought Jesus meant, that Lazarus would rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus tells Martha to quit looking for the answer to death somewhere down the road when he's standing right in front of you. I think that's true of a lot of people. They're waiting for eternal life when the Lord returns, when it's available to each of us today. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Not someday, today. Not I will be the resurrection, but I am the resurrection. Anyone who wants eternal life can have it today by trusting in Christ today. For all who were born again in Christ, we've experienced the power of the resurrection. We have passed from death to life. As Jesus asked Mary and Martha, do you believe this? On display at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, is an unusual book called the Jefferson Bible. As a conf confirmed deist, Thomas Jefferson believed in God, but not in the supernatural. So near the end of his life, he spent many hours with a pen, a knife, and glue, cutting and pasting passages from the four Gospels that contained the moral and spiritual teachings of Jesus, which he accepted, but removing all references to miracles, the supernatural, or the deity of Christ, which he rejected. The Jefferson Bible ends with the burial of Christ. It says, There they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. That's the way Jefferson's story ends. But thank God that's not the way the story really ends. For Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all end with the good news that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Because nearly 2,000 years ago, early on the first day of the week, Jesus himself rose from the dead, breaking the bonds of death and opening the way of eternal life for all who would follow him. Because he is the resurrection and the life. Which leads to the second part of our declaration, which we all need to hear. Jesus says, I am the life. Jesus embodies life. Jesus gives life because he is life. Life is a running theme throughout the whole Bible, but especially the Gospel of John, more than any other New Testament book. At the beginning of his story of Jesus, John says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Then in chapter 3, he tells Nicodemus that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Folks, we weren't made for death. We were made for life. We weren't made to be temporary. We were made for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has set eternity in the human heart. We instinctively know that there must be more than just this life. The Bible declares that everything, every living thing was made by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. Peter calls Jesus the author of life. Jesus can't stand death. When it says that Jesus was deeply moved at Lazarus' funeral... The word there means angry or upset. It is used of a horse snorting. Jesus snorted at death. He snorted at the destruction and the grief and misery that death has brought because of sin. 
That's not the way he created things to be. Ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God, death has plagued humanity. It robs us of those we love. It looms over our lives like a menacing spirit. The Bible says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that is exactly what Christ came to do. When the evangelist Dwight L. Moody was a young man, he was called upon on short notice to preach a funeral sermon. He hadn't done one before, so he hunted throughout the four Gospels trying to find one of Jesus' funeral sermons, but he couldn't find one. You know why? Because Christ broke up every funeral he ever attended. Death could not stand in the presence of the one who is the resurrection and the life. You want Jesus to do your funeral. Because there won't be one. Jesus says in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. He promises in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. That's incredible if you think about it. As long as Christ is living, so will we. That's a promise. Now you might be thinking, well, don't we all die someday? And here's the really shocking answer. We already have. As far as God is concerned, when we accept Christ, we die to sin. We die to our old self, and the new self is now alive forever. In Colossians 3.3, 3, Paul tells living believers, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Did you catch that? You've already died. You're already hidden in Christ. Christ is your life. Now, is Christ alive? Of course he is. Then what this tells us is we've got nothing to worry about. No virus is ever going to separate us from the love of Christ or from our life in Christ. That's not saying our bodies will never give out, but that's not the end. That's what many people in Jesus' day thought, and that's what many people really think today, that when you die, it's over, that you just simply cease to exist. But the Bible says that when you die in Christ, you live with Christ forever. Death is not the end. It's a passageway from life to greater life. It's an amplification of what we already have in Christ. It's like the turning point in the film, The Wizard of Oz. You know, the point where the whole world changes from black and white to living color. The life we've experienced so far will seem like black and white film compared to the high-def technicolor of heaven. Too many people are living in a world of unhappiness, a world of fear, and a world of grays. They need to be shocked to their senses, like the man who was walking around the town one day and he saw a sign in an undertaker's window that said, why walk around half dead when we can bury you for $37.50? Don't go around half dead. This is why John wrote his gospel, he tells us at the end. In John 20, 31, he says, he wrote this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believe in Jesus Christ and you can have eternal life right now. We think the worst thing that can happen to someone is that they die, but that's incorrect. For some people, dying is a relief from further suffering and decline and a blessed welcome home. No, the worst thing that can happen to someone is to live without Christ and to die without Christ because that is an eternal tragedy. Now in John chapter 8, Jesus blames the devil for death, saying he was a murderer from the beginning. In John chapter 10, Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But then Jesus contrasts his own purpose, saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to end the curse of death and to give us life, life to the full, life eternal. How can you know for sure if you have eternal life? 
I'm glad you asked. 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may hope, not that you may think, not that you may wish, but that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Then you may know that you have eternal life. Now, of course, there are other important steps the Bible tells us to take like repenting of your sins and confessing your faith publicly, being baptized and growing in a good Bible teaching church. But eternal life begins with belief. It begins with putting your faith in Christ as the son of the living God who came and died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead and for you asking him to be your savior and Lord. That's what Easter is really all about, new life. Maybe today can be a new beginning for you, or at least a reawakening of new life for you. Now, here are some takeaways from our story of Lazarus. First, it's okay to express tears and grief at a loss. Contrary to what some people say, it is not a lack of faith. The shortest verse in the Bible is also one of the most interesting. It says that Jesus wept. Jesus wept wept at the grief brought by death. So we shouldn't tell people, don't cry, don't grieve. That's how we process loss. But we do not grieve like those who have no hope because we have the hope of eternal life. And we have the hope of seeing our loved ones again who died in Christ. We're going to see them again someday. A second takeaway is that when you have troubles, you should take them immediately to Jesus. That's what Mary and Martha did, and that's what we should do as well. Jesus is our greatest possible source of comfort. He has felt human suffering. He has experienced death himself. And so it is through our trials that our faith deepens and that we're driven closer to our Lord to seek his help and to seek his strength. So if you're hurting or you're worried or you're anxious right now, Take your troubles to Jesus. Third, death does not have the last word. Life does. Death will be defeated. Life wins in the end. One day the bodies of all believers will be raised to life by our resurrected Lord himself. The trumpet will sound. His voice will call. Our body and our spirit will be reunited into a resurrected body as we come out of our graves alive. In the meantime, we should stop worrying and we should start living. What do you say? What did Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus has promised eternal life to all who believe in him. And then he asked the key question for each of us. Do you believe this? Don't cut up the Bible by rejecting the miraculous. Put your faith in the risen Lord. Life, forgiven, abundant, eternal, can be yours for the asking. Are you ready to commit your life to him? What better day than Easter? Pray and ask for Jesus to forgive your sins and to come into your heart so that you put your faith in him so that you can have eternal life today. We all live because he lives, because he is risen. Let's try that one more time. He is risen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll close with a song or two. Lord, we thank you for reminding us today that you are the resurrection and the life, and that we can have eternal life through faith in you. Awaken or reawaken our spirit, just as you awakened Lazarus from the dead. We're tired of hearing about disease and death day after day, so we turn to you for hope and for life. Thank you for coming to take away the sting of death and to give us the joy of eternal life, even now. We celebrate you today. We rejoice in your resurrection 
We can hardly wait to see you in person for ourselves someday. In the meantime, may we know you more fully and may we make the most of this life that you have given us and live it to the full for you. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We pray in your name, amen. I'd like to invite you back the next few weeks as we begin a new series in the book of Philippians, a wonderful book of joy, even in the midst of trials. We're so blessed to have four different pastors who are going to each take a chapter and share it with you. So tune in each Sunday for a fresh message right back here again. And we hope that these messages bring you joy in the midst of your trials. i yeah.